Let's, let's worship. Um, dear God, thank you so much for the chance to be here gathering in this room. Would you bless the service today? Would you bless the worship? We want to honor you in all that we say and do with the songs we sing, with the words we hear. We want to put them to, to work in our hearts. Holy Spirit, would you just flood this place? Would you speak to the people who are here? And would you help us to be changed and show us the steps you want us to take to also make changes? Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. out on us no matter how far away we run from you you're just right there waiting for us with open arms whenever we want to come back and we're just grateful and praising you for that today it's in jesus name i pray amen you, yeah if any of you guys feel like you want a little extra one-on-one time to talk about your your, your walk with god um we, we love getting to do that i love getting to do that so just see me after today and we can even schedule for tomorrow yeah if the door's open come in if you if, if it's not sign your name up and we'd love to have you so um just want to open that to you guys. So we're gonna we're gonna sing some more uh, to God. The next song is called "God Is Able," and it kind of goes along with what Path, Pastor Patrick's gonna be speaking about today. It has to do with the fact that you know, are are we believing that God is able even when He doesn't? 
because sometimes we want to sit back and say, well, he didn't, so he must not be able. But that, that's not actually true, and that's not what the Word says. God is always able, and he's always, he's always able, and he wants us to trust that he's always able. And when we sit in that and we just, and we just rest in him, it's amazing what he can do when we open ourselves up to that, that kind of faith where we're just saying, God, even, even in the brokenness, even in the difficulty, even when circumstances aren't going one way or the other, God, you're able. Um, all the while, you're able. And so that's what this ne- next song is about. Sing, God is able. God is able, and he will never fail. Is almighty God greater than all we see, greater than all we ask? He has done great things, lifted up, defeated the grave, raised to life. Our God is able in His name we overcome for the Lord our God is able God is with us and He is on our side God is with us, and He is on our side. He will make a way far above all we know, far above all we hope. He has done great things, lifted up. to life our God is able in his name we overcome for the Lord our God is able God is with us God is with us and he will go before he will never
dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name my hope my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name if you guys know the chorus just, just lift that up together Christ alone cornerstone the weak made strong in the same darkness seems when darkness seems to hide his face and I'll rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds my within the veil Christ alone cornerstone the weak made strong and the Savior's love through the storm He is Lord He's Lord verse it says when he will when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before your throne and that's what we get to look forward to as believers you know we battle in this life we, we know that eternity through Christ has been given to us from his life death and resurrection but we know we battle in this life and the Holy Spirit is here he's at work right now in this room and right at this very moment we can just rest in that truth of that verse that sometimes we feel like we can't get rest but there is an eternal rest and we all will get to be in the presence of God the Father for eternity um, not because of our actions or our success or our righteous deeds but because of his righteousness that he gave so freely to us and there's peace to be had in that there's rest to be had in that and the cool thing is I'm even learning um, He's wanting me to rest in that now. He's wanting me to go ahead and start resting in that now and take joy in that now. I don't have to wait for eternity to come to start thinking about that or enjoying that. He wants to help us rest now. And um, so when we sing that, that verse, I just want you guys to think about um, what you've been given in Jesus. You've been given eternal forgiveness, separating your sins as far as the east is from the west. And we get to just have joy as family in here, fellowshipping around that truth. So let's sing. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Jesus, you are God alone. 
we're not made faultless or righteous because of our own actions, but because of your, your action when you took that cross in our place, when you took on our sin, when you were, when you were buried and when you were raised from the dead. And God, when I believe that you can't heal something in me or fix something in me, help me to just remember that Jesus rose from the dead and he can raise whatever in me that is dead. And he can do that for every man and woman in this room. And I, I pray that you would meet them in their struggle and that you would speak that truth to them. And in the name of Jesus, by your Holy Spirit's power, would you just resonate that truth in them that you can raise it up in them. You can, you can bring them from death to life, the battles that they're facing right now. In Jesus' name, I speak that over this room. Would you speak to us through Pastor Patrick and his word um, and what you've shown him and what you've given him to share with us today? Will we be changed forever because of it? In Jesus' name, amen. You guys may be seated. Thank you so much. It's interesting that Daniel just ended with talking about asking God to raise things up inside of us, bring us life where there's death. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit more about the struggles that we're going through. Um, you know, as we get into sobriety, it seems like, especially when you guys write one week, two weeks, three weeks, you know, it's like, you know, the things that we were medicating, they didn't go away. The, the, the struggles we were running from, they didn't go away. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And we want to give you hope today. I want to give you hope um, that you're not alone. Because part of the reason why we medicate or we avoid the conflict is because we're afraid to get burned in the midst of the fire. So I want to tell you a message today, and we're going to talk about Actually, we're going to go through almost four different chapters in a book of the Bible called Daniel. And we're going to look. Yeah, what a good name. What a good name, right, <laughs> Pastor Daniel? <laughs> but we're going to tell you a story about three Hebrew boys that were put into the fire. And we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, it's an amazing story. Uh, when I say story, an event. Um, everything in the Old Testament, I believe, literally happened. But there's this amazing spiritual message that God wants to teach us through the physical world. He wants to teach us a spiritual truth. When I see Jesus healing the deaf and the blind and the lame, you know, I see him today healing the deaf, the blind, and the lame. But it may not be a physical healing, but it's certainly spiritual. When we come to invite Christ and let the Spirit into our life and surrender to him, he opens our eyes and the blind see. When we read the Word of God and it starts to speak to us where it never spoke before, He's opened our ears that we might hear what we couldn't hear. And when He gives us hope and strength and courage on the inside, we get up and we start to do the right things and He heals our lameness. Does this make sense? And so every time we go into the Old Testament, you have to understand and ask yourself, God, what are you trying to teach me? What's the meaning here? What's the spiritual application that I can apply in my life today? Every word has value. And God says it doesn't return to him void. So go ahead and give me the next slide. I want to set this up in Daniel's 1, 2, 3. I want to set this up and I want to talk about uh, what was going on at the time. Now we're talking five, six hundred years B.C. We're talking uh, going back a number of years to the Babylonian Empire. And we're talking about some Hebrew boys but we want to know, we talk about Israel, I'll talk about this whole area right here. This is the Babylonian Empire. You're talking Iran, Iraq, Israel, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, all the way up into Turkey. Of course, you got Italy and Greece up here. It's a pretty big chunk of land there. Nebuchadnezzar, who we learn about in Daniel chapters 1 through 4, we learn about him. This was his empire. He was the king of Babylon, which we've all heard that name before. He was the king of Babylon. So as they conquered, they would bring back the best of the best into the culture of the Babylonian city where it was the empire's heart. But I want you to know in Israel, at this particular time in history, Israel was split into two, the north and the south. And there were two prophets, one in the north and one in the south. And the prophet in the north was Hosea and the prophet in the south was Isaiah. And, of course, I think many of you, if you've been in any kind of Christian church for a while, you've heard the name Isaiah. You may not know so much about Hosea. 
But both of them were preaching to Israel, especially Hosea, no one was listening. Because you see up here, Hosea was bordering Syria, and Syria had been taken over by Babylon, and it was a hedonistic society. Drugs, sex, rock and roll, baby. And so Hosea was preaching to Israel, and they weren't listening. Look, if you don't worship God and you start to worship the culture next to you and start to let them assimilate you into their culture, you will be a slave. And you'll be destroyed. But they didn't listen. So eventually what happened is Babylon, who was the root of the controlling empire, took over Israel. Go ahead and give me the next slide. And when he took over Israel, um, I, I'll get to that in a second. I want to read this Isaiah. We were just talking about him as a prophet. Listen to what he had to say here. And believe it or not, this was about 100 years prior to them being taken over by Nebuchadnezzar. So the prophet, the warning, it's here, but it's, listen to what he has to say. The one who created you says, do not be afraid, for I have bought you with a price. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you'll not drown. When you walk through the fire of injustice, you'll not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord, your God, and Savior. Now, it doesn't sound like he's warning them here, but what he's saying is, is because you don't listen and because you are disobedient, you're going to go through this. But take heed and be comforted, and God will not let you drown. He will not let you be burned up. See, the proof of that is you're here today. You're here today. You could have drowned. You could have been burned up by the circumstances and the decisions that we made in our past, correct? So to hold this thing, Isaiah in your mind, realize what's going on. He's preaching. And Israel, there were three boys. Go ahead and give me the next slide. Thank you. All right. I'll take that off. I want you to see this in Daniel 1 through 3. The Babylonians invade and conquer Israel, and they enslaved the educated and the prominent. So what they did is, you know, if you were like really good, like a scientist or uh, someone that was good with agriculture or you were a chef, man, they could use you. You come back and you worked for the king. Shadrach, Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego, they're all four friends. They all were taken and they were brought into the court of Nebuchadnezzar. They all had gifts. They were advisors, they understood astrology, they understood, uh, I mean astronomy, not astrology. They understood science, they understood agriculture, they were trained. They, were, they had a lot of gifts to be an advisor in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, Daniel, uh, if we even you remember some of the stories with Daniel, there were times he's the same Daniel that was thrown into a lion's den. He's the same Daniel that God's angels shut the mouths of the lions. You see, these three boys, these four Hebrew boys, God kept using them to show Nebuchadnezzar who God was. You see, they were Israelites who knew the God of creation. They were Israelites who knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were Israelites that were brought into a Babylonian empire, and even their names were changed for them to assimilate into that, Assyri that Babylonian culture, but they never stopped worshiping God. Their identity never changed. And they continued to worship God. And no matter what happened, they would worship. And then there would be this incredible miracle. And Nebuchadnezzar kept seeing God at work. How many here in your life have seen God work in your life, but have still been like arm's length? And that's sort of like Nebuchadnezzar. He was seeing God work in all these different miracles, but he was at arm's length. He had knowledge of this God, but he himself still knew he was God. When we continue to work in our own will, who are we saying is God? Me. I'm God. I know best. I do what's right. As my dear friend Dr. B would say, how'd that work out for you? So Nebuchadnezzar, despite seeing, stay, go back to that one. Nebuchadnezzar, okay, I'm sorry, one more. There you go, my problem. Nebuchadnezzar at this particular point realizes he saw miracles, he saw everything going on, and he sets up this, despite that, he still wanted to be worshipped as God. He looked out over the empire and he said, look at what I have built. I think everyone should worship me. So he builds this huge 90 foot high, 9 foot wide. Everyone heard, everyone heard this, 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 this huge idol. And everyone, when they heard the music from the courts, they were ordered to bow down and worship this idol. So you can imagine working through your day 
And all of a sudden you hear the music in the distance from the courts of the Babylonian Empire or the courts of the king's, king's palace. As soon as you heard it, you were commanded to bow where you were towards the statue to worship Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> I was thinking about that. How many of y'all in this room can relate to the drugs of your choice, the addiction of your lives playing that music? Asking you to bow down and worship. Can we admit that today? Because that's what Nebuchadnezzar was asking them to do. Bow and worship me as God. It's kind of ironic that it would be when the music played. I found that kind of humorous to me when God showed that to me. Yep, Patrick, yep. yep you bow down when you heard the music. Well, Go ahead and give me the next slide. Thank you. These three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were in the court. And what Nebuchadnezzar had said was, if you do not worship me, I'm going to throw you into a fiery furnace. And so they didn't worship him. And, and he was furious, but he even, because he valued them, he even asked them to come into the court and he gave them a second chance. All right, there must be some confusion, boys. You are valuable to me, but hey, I'm God and the king, and so if I say it, I have to do it. When the music plays, you must worship my idol and worship me. And the Hebrew boys responded back to Nebuchadnezzar. There it is. Nebuchadnezzar saying, if you do not worship me, you'll be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is this God that can deliver you from my hands? Because they said, Nebuchadnezzar, you can do what you wish, but we're not going to worship an idol. We're going to worship the Lord our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're not going to worship the God of our drugs, the God of our choosing, and the God that calls, that calls us into death and destruction. We're not going to do that. And so Nebuchadnezzar says to them, well, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace then if you don't worship. And this is what they responded to him when he gave them their final warning. This is what the Hebrew boy said to him. This is what Daniel was referring to earlier when he was playing the worship song. This is what they said. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we, not, we don't need to answer you. If it be so, our God is able to deliver us from the fire. And he will deliver us. But if not, let it be known to all that we will not serve any of the gods. Or worship the image before us. You see, y'all have a lot of circumstances going on in your life. A lot of stuff you may not like. A lot of stuff that you may think set against you. Relationally, legally, criminal, criminally, financially, whatever. You, there's a lot of things being set up against you. And everything is going to be coming against you with your drug of choice or the addiction saying, here's the, hear the music, worship me. And challenging you whether you believe God can deliver you from the situations that you face. And I love the attitude of these boys. It's like God's able. God is able to walk you through anything you're going through today. He's able to walk you through it. He's able. He created the universe and holds it in his hand. He can certainly handle whatever problems in your life. But even if he doesn't, he's still God. And he still promises to work it out for the good. He still promises that if you'll trust him, even if, trust him to be God, that he will deliver you through the fire. Let's go on and look at the next scripture. The, he throws the three Hebrew boys into the fire. Now picture this. A fiery furnace back then would be, picture a train tunnel, right? It'd be like, a, like an opening, like a tunnel, and then everything would be thrown in there, and that was the fiery furnace. That's where all the trash was burned. All right, so it wasn't a pit. It was more like a tunnel. Everything thrown in. Make sense? Like a furnace door. And so <laughs> he throws Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He has the guards actually take them and throw them into the fire. It was so hot that it says it burned the arms of the soldiers putting them in. And listen to the scripture. After they were in the fire, the king looked into the fire and he shouted, I see four men united and walking around the fire. And the fourth looks like a god. The king shouted again, come out. So they all stepped out 
and he realized the fire had not touched them. They were not even scorched, nor even the smell of smoke. The scripture says not even a hair was singed. And so he throws him in this fire. He looks in there. It's not just the three Hebrew boys. There he is. With, there they are with Jesus. They were dancing and celebrating. Do you know when you have that kind of relationship with Jesus, you can look at the trials in your life and you can dance and celebrate. You know, that fire is there for you. It's there as a testimony to everyone around you. You're not alone. He's with you through the trials of your life because that fire signifies the trials and what's going on in your life. It's also burning up what God wants to take away. It's like gold being refined, where you can skim it off at the surface. What a testimony this was to Nebuchadnezzar when they came out. Now think about this. Next slide. Jesus, the Son of God, was there with the three Hebrew boys in that fiery furnace. In this situation, God didn't prevent them from circumstances or protect them from the fire. He protected them in the fire. Listen to what I'm saying. Our God is able, but even if he doesn't, he's still our God. Understand what that message means. God didn't protect them from the fire, even though he could have. But he's still their God, and he let them go through the fire, but he was with them in the fire. He's able to take away the circumstances, but he doesn't always do that. But he'll protect you in it. He'll walk with you through it. Because look at the testimony to God. Look at their own faith, how it grew. Look what my God just brought me through. Do you think their faith grew with that? Their closeness and intimacy and, and, and surrender to God through that process? He's able. And so there it is. He didn't take the circumstances away, but he was with them in the midst of it. And I think that's an amazing message for you guys today. I don't know what it is you're going through. And I know that you pray, God, take this away. God, fix this. God, change that. Oh, he can. He's able. But even if he doesn't, he'll walk with you through it. You won't get burned. You'll come out on the other side refined. Like Jesus being resurrected on the other side of the cross. We're not alone in the trials of our life. The Holy Spirit lives in us. It's the heart of all believers. It is the essence. This is the essence of step three. Am I able to go through my inventory in four? Am I able to make amends Am I able to, in eight? Am I able to look at my defects in six? Am I able to do all these things? My God is able because he, he's not going to allow me to avoid it. And if he does, he can. But if he doesn't, I, I, he's with me and I won't get burned through that process. I can look at my defects. I can look at the things going on in my life, the hurts, the wounds, the resentments, the fears. I can be honest about it in step four. Because in step three, I came to believe that my God, and I surrendered to him, that he's able. He's able to do the work. That on the other side of working this program, he'll resurrect you like he did Jesus. Because it's the same Holy Spirit in you that raised Jesus from the dead, which Daniel taught us earlier when he was singing. He's able. And he's with you. And he's right there in the fire, and he wants you to celebrate and dance, because when you come out on the other side of the fire, there's everything to be thankful for. And it's a testimony to everyone in your lives. Wow, something different about him, something different about her. Thank God. Walk with him. He's faithful. We can trust him. Next slide. Hmm. I love these scriptures. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. I, I look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Despite the circumstances, they were taken slaves. They were in a foreign culture. They were forced to serve another king, but they wouldn't bow down to an idol. How often do we bow down to what the TV tells us? How often do we bow down to what this culture tells us? How often do we bow down when our urges tell us, no, oh, do this or do that? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind. Those three boys did, and they weren't going to serve any other king, any other God, or any other idol than the Lord thy God. You're here during this time at treatment to grow in the intimacy of that relationship and so that you know that you know he's able and he wants you to worship him and only him and stop worshiping the idols that you've placed before him. 
because all of them have led to your destruction and are leading towards your death. And He only wants to give you life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. I think this will help. God says, no, I want you to do this. Well, am I going to be God or is He? But I don't understand. Well, trust Him. He's able. Well, how is He going to resurrect me on the other side? Well, Jesus modeled that. Not my will, God, yours. I trust you. And you're able. I think that worked out for him pretty good on the other side of the cross. But he had to go through some pain. I'm not saying you're not going to go through the fire. But you're going to come out on the other side. So much better. Exactly what God would have. When I acknowledge him, he directs my path. So I can either serve the idols of my addiction and let it tell me what to do. Or I can bow down and worship God and let him lead my life. It's a choice. Next slide. Hmm. Now think about this. Those three Hebrew boys, when I went back and I was talking about Isaiah, you don't think they didn't know that scripture? That when I'm put in the fire and I walk through the fire, I won't be burned? When I'm drowning in the sea, I won't, I, I, I won't die? The scripture that Isaiah, Isaiah said, you will walk through that fire and you won't be burned. You don't think that wasn't in their mind, in their heart, when they were in the midst of that trial with Nebuchadnezzar? Of course it was. They knew that scripture as if it were a part of their heart, and they trusted God because they served Him only. When you know the Word of God and you put it in your heart and you know God's able, then He'll direct your path. His thoughts are not like our thoughts. His ways aren't our ways. They're so far beyond anything I can imagine. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so the, uh, are higher the ways you, God, than my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, he says. God's thoughts are higher than mine. What am I going to serve? Mine or his? Who's God? Me and my thoughts or God and his? Which one are you going to serve? This is the choice you've got to make when you surrender in a step three. Not my will, but God's. Not my thoughts, but his. But I don't know his thoughts. Well, it's time to get to know him. What would Jesus think? What would he say? Why did God give us Jesus in the Gospels? So I would actually be able to see modeled God's thoughts in action. So the closer we know that, the more that we can serve and worship it. Again, don't copy the behaviors of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So what are you going to serve? Your past? Or a God who wants to lead you into the future? You're going to serve your addiction? Next slide. Or you're going to serve God? You have two choices. You're either going to live in faith or you're going to live in fear. You're going to serve fear or you're going to serve faith. Which one are you going to worship? But, 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 but. There's a fire. There's a problem. What will they think? What will they say? What will I do? Fear. Second Timothy. God didn't give me the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. God wants us to serve faith. It's a choice. I'm going to serve the God of all creation. And I believe he's able. That's my faith. My faith is to believe he's able. God is able to deliver you. Last slide, go back to the first one. No problem. God is able to deliver you through the fiery furnace into a resurrected life. He's able. So today I just want to leave you with this. As far as the message goes, I want to leave you with this today. While you're here, before you leave, and even before you do your formal steps, number one, you're broken, you can't fix yourself. Number two, there is a God, and He's able. Number three, start worshiping Him and surrendering to Him in your life. His way is not yours. His thoughts are not yours. And then He will direct your new life. And you'll have a great chance of sobriety if you choose to serve the God of all creation. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray in closing. Father, thank you so much for today. And I thank you, Lord, that you are able, that you love us. And even though we go through trials, even though we don't understand, your ways are higher than our ways. Your ways, Father, are much different than what we think. Help us to not conform to our old way of thinking. Help us not to conform to what this world says. But, Lord, that we serve you. You are our God. You are able 
to bring us through the details and situations of our life if we would just keep our eyes on you, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I believe today, Lord, and I trust in you that if I do all the right things today, loving you, loving others, that you will give me the best tomorrow I could ever want. But it starts with serving you and believing you're able. In Jesus' name, amen.